Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching. I must say, uh, I've never used that little 30 second intro, but it's, it's very dramatic. So um, I don't know if I'll be using that one again, but very dramatic. Um, you guys are watching a the Nurse Break Live Q&A interview, where I interview awesome health professionals, Australian nurses from around Australia. We get some insights into their careers and what they're doing, and we can all get a bit inspired. Today with me, I've got Adjunct Associate Professor Alyssa O'Keefe. She's a nurse practitioner, an industry pioneer, um, a sexual health and reproductive health nurse practitioner, but primarily currently she's uh, in the cosmetic nursing field and she's one of Australia's uh, leading nurses uh, or, and experts in cosmetics and cosmetic nursing. So Alyssa, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jackson. It's really exciting to be here tonight. It's fun. I'm currently in Melbourne. It's um, I've just come off night shifts. I've woken up 30 minutes ago and um, I'm off for another night shift tonight. It's currently cold and 6 p.m. Where are you at the moment? Well, I'm in Canberra and it's 6 p.m. here too and it is absolutely freezing tonight. So um, mm. we're expecting snow over the weekend. So yes, very cold. I, yes, that's all Canberra's known for, right? Being cold. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to talk to anybody about Canberra, but um, yeah, it is a bit cold at this time of the year. Yes. Okay. I'll do a quick introduction, but I'm like, I'll get you to do it properly yourself because there's there's a lot to say. Uh, adjunct Associate Professor Alyssa O'Keefe uh, was ACT's first nurse practitioner. How very cool. And you are also the current chair of the Australian College of Nursing, the Cosmetic Nursing Community of Interest. Um, you were the lead author of the first ever Australian standards of scope of practice document for cosmetic nursing in Australia. You're a managing director and owner of a very popular business in Australia, Bravura. Uh, and you live in Canberra with your surveyor husband. You've got some goldfish, I believe, and you've got a, a son who's a nurse. Yeah. Is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. You say, uh, that bio makes me sound completely manic. But look, to tell you the truth, Jackson, I am completely manic. So, um, yes, I'm happy to talk to you about anything tonight. I have had an eclectic career and it continues to jump from um, challenge to challenge. So, you know, starting out as a paediatric nurse and then um, being now a cosmetic nurse and actually still, I'm still doing women's health work at the moment too. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of the in-betweeners with you tonight, but um, I guess one of the main philosophies that I've always lived by is um, say yes first and then work out how you're going to do it next. So I often describe to people when they say to me, oh, my God, you know, Alyssa, what are you doing now? I say, well, you know, I'm throwing out the paver and then stepping on it. I actually haven't paved the way yet. So a lot of the things I do, I um, I kind I kind of make them up as I go, which sounds really terrible. <laughs> um, is is an incredibly creative process, and um, one of my uh, nurse practitioner students a number of years ago described me as a triumph of confidence over experience. Um, but sitting here with you tonight, whilst that felt like an insult, I actually feel like now I'm a triumph of experience. So um, happy to share any of any of that with you. <laughs> So is there any specific questions that your um, audience has for me tonight or would you like to just see where this goes or how would you like to how would you like to run it? So exactly right. I mean, you are a wealth of experience. So anyone who is watching, this is live. So you can just post your comments on Facebook as you watch. And if you're lucky and you probably all will be, I'll ask Alyssa uh, and we'll get those questions answered for you. Um, so how I sort of want to run this is because you have done quite a lot. I'm going to start with a little bit about maybe sexual and reproductive health. We can just get a little understanding oh, yeah. of that and the role of a nurse practitioner. But then we'll sure. quite quickly move into um, cosmetic nursing because that's where you're currently sort of focused. Alrighty. So I wonder if anyone out there can relate to the fact that you get a little bit tired of doing ward nursing and you get a little bit tired maybe of doing shift work. Mm. And that's where I was um, when I was pregnant with my son. So he's 27 now and, as you say, he's a registered nurse. So after I went back to the hospital after having him, I was wondering what else there was out there that really interested me that wasn't working in a hospital. So I had all, always had a really strong interest in women's health. And in fact, when I was a student nurse, we I did two placements in the gynecology ward. So I did one as part of my um, you know my routine placement. And then we got to choose at the end of our of, of our third year where we wanted to go back to. And I chose gynecology because I really, really loved it. 
Um, so I had a bit of a look around and there was it was back in the olden days when you'd look for a job in the newspaper and there was um there was two jobs there was one in sexual health and one in women's health and i thought that would be something that i would really love to do so i moved across to work at family planning act which is now called chef pact which was the most amazing grounding in sexual and reproductive health care doing the courses through there and working with them for a short while then I moved from there um, out to Queanbeyan, which is just outside of Canberra. It's a, a small regional town, um, relatively low socioeconomic groups out there, pockets of um, 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 ex-prisoners, sex workers, mm -hmm. drug users, which were the target for mm -hmm. going out and setting up a sexual health service there. So I did that for a couple of years and worked with an amazing team right across southern New South Wales, specifically targeting those at-risk groups. I was there for a couple of years and the clinical nurse consultant at the Canberra host Hospital from Canberra Sexual Health Centre rang me one day and she said to me, we've got the opportunity to be part of um, a research project for nurse practitioners in the ACT. She said, the sexual health unit, we want to be part of that and we would like you to come and work for us and help drive it. Are you interested? And I was like, mm. oh, my God, am I interested? You bet. And, of course, it was another case of what the hell is this? I don't even know what this means, but I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I became, um, I moved across back to ACT Health, which I'd been in, you know, way before when I worked in paediatrics and general mm. surgical etc so I was back at Canberra Hospital and I ended up working at the Canberra Sexual Health Centre for 15 years wow wow yeah yeah it was one of the most remarkable workplaces I've ever ever worked um a highly functioning team um a, a team that was always striving to deliver uh what was in the best interest of our patients so uh when I worked at Canberra Sexual Health Centre I was involved in some incredible projects. Uh, one of the um, focuses of working there was doing outreach work, so physically getting out of the clinic mm -hmm. and going and, and targeting the audiences that we were most interested in. So I used to have the opportunity, and as far as I'm aware, these programs are still running, had the opportunity to go and work um, in a youth prison, uh, mm -hmm. youth health service, um, always makes for really good dinner conversation when I say to people I've worked in every brothel in Canberra. So <laughs> we have worked in every brothel in Canberra um, doing sexual health screening for the sex workers out there. So that was the most amazing experience. How, how did they, um, how, how were they, were they receptive, uh, both people who were in, in, in the justice system but also uh, in brothels, were they receptive to receiving healthcare and, and advice or was there sort of this, um, did they also feel stigmatised by not knowing because they'd had previous bad experiences with healthcare? No, I don't think they'd had bad experiences with healthcare particularly. I think automatically your entree as a nurse paves the way for you. So already the fact that you're a nurse, they understand, you know, the philosophy of your care and where you're coming from. Um, interestingly enough, when I did the nurse practitioner research um, about the model of care, um, when I was the first nurse practitioner, the, practitioner in the ACT, one of our primary um, groups that helped us with the research were the sex workers in Canberra. And there wasn't one sex worker who denied consent to participate in the mm. research. They so strongly believed in what we were doing and were happy to support us that every single one that I asked said yes, which was mm. unbelievable, yeah. Do you think there is enough education at the undergraduate level about sexual health? Because um, I can't remember learning at all about sexual health at uni. Um, look, probably not, but Jackson, you know, we, we, we pushed all of our agendas onto undergraduates, onto primary schools, onto high schools. We can't teach everything. So mm. I, I look, I, I wouldn't want to say there isn't enough. I think there's so much to learn anyway. Um, I think the people that are interested find a way to weave it into their undergraduate, and I certainly did because I had a passion for it. Um, so I think you cover plenty in the undergraduate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, how does one become a nurse practitioner? And and I believe you're a primary healthcare nurse practitioner. Can you sort of explain how that is yeah. differentiated? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, let me just start with what is a nurse practitioner because I, and, and we're moving on to cosmetics, so this will start to all tie together as we go. I spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago who owned her own business, a cosmetic medicine business. She was already employing nurses, doctors, um, some beauty therapists as well. She had one clinic and she said to me, she rang me because I do a lot of mentoring um, of people all over Australia. She rang me and said, I'd like to be a nurse practitioner. I said, that's really great. I said, why do you want to be a nurse practitioner? She said, because I want to write my own scripts for um, dermal fillers and um, muscle relaxants. Mm. I said, right. I said, well, what else do nurse practitioners do? And she went, oh, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. And I, it really took me aback. And I'm like, really? I said, you know, nurse practitioners are not involved, not only involved at clinical practice at that highest level, but we're also involved in education, we're involved in um, research, we're involved in um, improving and enhancing not only the nurse practitioner role, but the, the culture of nursing overall. So I think there's a real misconception out there, particularly with people in the cosmetic industry, that it, no, being a nurse practitioner is, is a way not to have to pay a doctor to get a script for your injectables. And it's just not true. The, um, the mm. broad foundation of being a nurse yeah. practitioner is phenomenal. Um, it's all of those things and more. The, you know, you know the, clin it's the, clinic the clinical practice isn't just um, autonomous practice in a really restricted scope. It's very broad. It's very complex. Um, and I think that's not, well, not really well understood by the general community out there, the community of nurses. Um, Interesting. I love your question I, I about what. Hmm. Oh, go, Jackson, go. Oh, I no, love. No, the no, question. no. Continue, continue. <laughs> because nurse practitioners originally we were kind of sliced and diced a little bit into our specialty. So for me, being a sexual health nurse, yeah. a sexual health nurse practitioner, that's all very nice. But there's probably only about six jobs in Australia that are sexual health nurse practitioners. And I tell you what, if you're already in one of those positions, you don't want to leave because it's the most amazing, challenging and rewarding work. So nobody moves out of their job. So so I had to really, really think about what I was going to do after I had done my time as a sexual health nurse practitioner. I was already registered on the board as a community nurse practitioner back when we had state-based registration. So I had already started thinking much more broadly than sexual health. So after I um, uh, was in, in just strictly sexual health, my next move from there was into general practice. So I did a significant amount of general practice in between to broaden out my scope, um, to, to get much more knowledge, uh, about you know chronic diseases acute care so I did some general practice as well and then I've narrowed right down again into women's health but I went broad before I went narrow so I have a lot of people saying things to me like I want to be a wound nurse practitioner or I want to be a cosmetic nurse practitioner some of the really great work that um, um, uh, Dr Chris Helms has been doing he's a nurse practitioner here in Canberra is he's been looking at the different <laughs> medical for nurse practitioners and trying to determine specifically how we can um, um, rationalise those, those scopes of practice so we can teach them well in university and then so that we've got job opportunities. So I would say to people, if you are interested in becoming a nurse practitioner, think as broadly as possible about your scope of practice. Once you are endorsed with the board, then you can narrow it down again but keep it as broad as possible, whether it be aged care, acute care, primary health care, keep your scope as broad as possible because there's going to come a time when you don't want to be what you are anymore and you're going to be wanting to branch out into something else. Yeah. So so those who are watching, if you have any questions that are related to being a nurse practitioner, being in sexual, if you have any questions about sexual reproductive health, um, or cosmetic nursing, just put them in the comments now um, so we can start feeding those through. So Melanie Rose is a nurse practitioner in the Phillip, in Phillip Island in Victoria, and she's written an article for me that is uh, yet to be released. And she she's uh, a co-owner of, of, a, of a business and um, as, a, as a nurse practitioner. Now, you're also a business owner. So how did you go from being a pediatric nurse to a business owner, and what is your business bravura? Oh, wow. So... Um so after I moved away from sexual health, I 
what did I do? I'm just trying to think what I did. Oh, I went and worked. <laughs> I think what I did, I went and worked at the Royal College of Nursing actually in a professional position. That was a really interesting move because um, when I was a student, I always knew that I wanted to go and work at the Royal College, which is now called the Australian College of Nursing. And I had my eye on a very specific position there, which was the um, senior nurse advisor position. So um, strongly interwoven into all of the professional work done by the college. Um, and so I had done a lot of work with the Australian College of Nurse Practitioners in the initial swap, swap, uh, swap over from becoming an association to a college. I was the secretary at the time, so I'd really um, sharpened my teeth on uh, politics and policy. So I moved over to the Royal College. Um, became really evident after I left, uh, uh, when I was at the college that I really was a clinician and I terribly, terribly missed being in clinical practice. So mm. I resigned from that position with nowhere to go. And I've done that twice in my career. I've resigned and had no job to go to. And um, as terrifying as it was, it was really empowering. And the the universe abhors a vacuum. So something always comes across your path. So mm. I left uh, the College of Nursing with, with nowhere to go yeah. after a year because I just went, I'm not sure what I really want to do but I know I want to do something. And so I had been keeping an eye on, keeping an eye, watching out for, I guess, um, <laughs> a, a nurse here in Canberra called Susie Hoytink who had her own skin clinic. Mm. And so I, lo I, I kept seeing her advertising on television and I thought, gee, this colleague of mine, I think she needs help. So I took myself down for a consultation to one of her clinics to suss them out. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. This is like I'm, I'm quite interested in what they do here because at, at that stage there was a whole lot of um, their, their core business was um, skin conditions like um, hormonal um, pigmentation, acne, rosacea, uh, resurfacing for scarring. And mm. we hadn't even begun to do cosmetic injectables. It was all about skin. And I have always had a huge thing about skin so i got my first pimple at 11. <laughs> here at 53 i'm just getting over another one so the I worst the worst the worst and so i've always had a real thing for skin so i worked with susie for five years and i was her clinical nurse consultant and uh between us we took the business from um two clinics to five clinics which she eventually sold the year before last Mm. And um, I developed all of the um, policies and procedures, the education, the um, the orientation, all of those things for the nursing team team there. And um, after I left there, so I sort of I sort of hit my max there again, and just there's really nowhere for me to go. And I again I took some time out. I resigned, and I had nowhere to go. And at that stage, my I'm one of three sisters, and my younger sister had got breast cancer at at 34 mm. and at that stage she was just past her five-year survival um, of not getting cancer again and we had always said that the three of us would go um, overseas together to celebrate so um, I resigned from Clear Complexions Clinic and went to Africa with my sisters and went on safari about probably like, 10 times and I kicked back with um, some really great local beers and campfires and lots and lots of elephant spotting and and, yep. and lion spotting <laughs> and thought oh um i think i think i want to um develop up my own laser safety courses because mm. i've done a lot of education and the gap that i saw was all of the laser safety education that was being done um within that sector so this is five years ago now was all being done um auspice by beauty therapy um organizations and the quality was really poor. And I thought, I can do this better. So I came home from Africa and I swear to God, within two days of landing back in Australia, I got a call from the general manager from the Australasian College of Cosmetic Surgery. She lives in Bowral and I live in Canberra. And she said to me, I've got something really, uh, I've got something I think you'll be really interested in. Do you want to meet in Bowral for lunch? And I went, absolutely. So I hopped in the car and up I went. And I kid you not, when we sat down to lunch, she said to me, I've been thinking that we should develop something for the college to do with laser safety. What do you think? Would mm. you be interested in writing it? And I said, that this is unbelievable. I said, that's exactly what I was going to do next. I said, I'm mm. not interested in writing it for the college, but I'm going to write it anyway 
when I write it, I want to own it. It's my IP. I want to own it. I said, when mm. I do that, would you be interested in implementing it? And so they did. And so now our beginners and advanced course is the um, the core education for the registrars from the College of Cosmetic Surgery. It's the core um, education for the nurses at the College of Nursing, for the dermatology and the cosmetic nursing uh, graduate certificates. Um, and we have a whole lot of other customers across Australia and New Zealand that um, were their go-to people for their training. So I love how you took an idea and you just did it. And and you literally, that's, that's the key, I think. You just... I think that's what stops a lot of people anywhere who just want to do something. Same thing happened with me for the nurse break is I had the idea and I paused and then I don't know what it was, but I had this epiphany. If I don't do it, it'll just never happen. You just have to do it and you take that risk. So what you've just said is the exact same thing. I think that um, is pivotal to making something successful. Um, I've just completely lost my question. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Yes. But what you did, Jackson, what was it that you did that made you jump and do it? What, what was that I, moment when you went, bugger it, I'm going to do it? I think it was it was the realisation that if I don't do it, it's going to happen anyway by someone else. So I want to pioneer it. Um, yeah. But same thing for you. So you took that business, as you mentioned, and where is it now today? Well, now today, so we started off, when I started, I had uh, essentially one online course, which I I literally took from being a PowerPoint presentation and got it converted into a, a video. Mm -hmm. And I uploaded onto a learning management system. I didn't have a website. I didn't have anything. So I shipped with the minimal viable product. And I've done that a lot. In fact, once when I was in Hawaii, I sold a laser safety podiatry course while I was overseas and I hadn't even written the course. So I, had to, I had to cobble together all of the things from the cosmetic uh, one that had relevance to podiatry and mm. actually deliver a course. Um, so I've gone from um, having no website and just one um, one course. We've got, I, I think, about 25 courses now. Some are laser safety some are uh, uh, clinical practice for laser, skin tightening um, technologies, fat reducing technologies. Cosmetic injectables is our newest one for registered nurses who'd like to become injectors. Mm. And I have um, a two part-time staff, one full-time. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, so yeah. so, it's, so it's, it's grown to something. It's grown to something quite big. What I want to ask is, I guess, Briefly, what is a cosmetic nurse? And then, and I guess compare that to a beauty therapist because I, when I was planning for this, I didn't even think about the word beauty therapist. So what is the difference? And mm -hmm. um, the second part I want you to focus on is how does one actually, uh, I've had quite a few people ask me, is how does one actually become one? And there is a lot of different training options from, that I, from my research. So what sort of training options exist to become a cosmetic nurse? And um, I'm going to declare my hand because I'm going to be really biased in my answers that I give you now. So I'll, I'll just say that straight up. So a cosmetic nurse, I think the best way to describe a cosmetic nurse is a cosmetic nurse is the love child of a dermatology nurse and a um, plastic surgery nurse. So what, what has happened is with, within both those scopes of practice, dermatology and plastic surgery, there's been this area that crosses over that is to do with um, um, cosmetic procedures like uh, laser, intense pulse lights, skin needling and cosmetic injectables. So it's almost like a, a, a an area in common of both of those specialties and it's kind of begun to, to, to develop a life of its own. Now, becoming a cosmetic nurse is... The journey is very similar to any other change of scope of practice that any of us would have. So when we're shifting over to something else, so say for, for me now I start to move into wound management, you're going to get the adequate education knowledge that you need to be able to be competent at what you do. And we all do learn in different ways and do different things. But one of the things that I've seen with cosmetic nursing is there's, you know, some courses are two days, some courses are, you know, 10 months. I don't think one of those is even better than the other. But what I see time after time with these courses is that these nurses are charged huge amounts of money to attend. They're shown how to essentially become an injector and there's more to being a cosmetic nurse than being an injector and I can come mm. back to that. 
but the nurses weren't being equipped with all of the other things that they need to actually um, like have their own business or, or to do something with what they've learned. So mm. one of the things that we've done at Bravura is we've partnered with a, a company called Cosmetic Skin Therapies, which um, I am the head of uh, clinical operations for. I sound really manic when I talk about the things that I do. I think I actually bend time somehow to fit lots into my week. But um, the, the reason I chose to work with Cosmetic Skin Therapies is it's um, it's a company, it's a, a franchise, but it's a franchise like not no one has ever seen before because it's set up specifically to support registered nurses. So there's 22 franchisees across Australia. It's the biggest franchise you've never heard of. Um, and they're all, I know, and they're all in different um, different parts of their journey. So some of them mm. are branded as cosmetic skin therapy, same as the parent company, but others are just um, renting a room in a with, in with a beauty therapist. Others have multiple rooms and, and, and have multiple staff. But why we chose what we did with Bravura, so we have a four-day um, course. We do um, an online component. So all of the nurses that attend their practical have done the education and the exam before they get to their practical. So we're not filling empty vessels when they get there. So they're already starting, you know, halfway. Mm. We spend two days with absolute hands-on doing the cosmetic injectables. So we do... Um, um, upper face muscle relaxants, we do lip filler, we do cheek filler. And then the second set of two days that they come back, they just absolutely nail their skills for those two days. So it's, it's hands on for those whole four days. But not only do we do that, but we expose them to that cosmetic skin therapy franchise model as well. Because what that is, is it's a business in a box. So if you want to become a cosmetic nurse, um, you can actually run your own business. And this is a really new concept for nurses to not work for someone. And instead of um, instead of working for someone and, you know, they're driving the Ferrari, we yep. have the nurses now who are the business owners and they're doing incredibly well in their businesses as well. Mm. Good, good returns, is that what you mean? Oh, great return. If, you're a, if you've got a smart business head and, we, you know, we help with all of those systems, you know, primarily uh, clinical compliance and um, um, uh, maintaining that clinical excellence, but, you know, give them all the things that they need to be able mm. to run a business so they just be a nurse and do that well. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so there's different ways. And um, so you're, you offer the four-day course with an educational component and all the yeah. theory beforehand. So yeah. another question that was posed to me, was can ENs become a cosmetic nurse? Yeah, absolutely. ENs can become cosmetic nurses. Um, to administer medications, they need, of course, to be um, endorsed enrolled nurses. Okay. Um, anyone who's spoken to me about enrolled nurses will know what my stance on dermal filler is. My personal stance on dermal filler is it's outside the scope of an EEN. Um, I don't think muscle relaxants are. I think they're certainly in the scope of an endorsed enrolled nurse. What's the and what's the is it what's the reasoning behind that? Is is it due to the um, yeah? What's the reasoning behind that? Look, it's to do with the the anatomy and the high risk uh, associated with dermal filler. Okay. Um, you know, one of the risks associated with it is permanent irreversible blindness. For example, mm -hmm. um, it's well outside the scope of an EAN to be um, managing anything like that. Okay, so the, yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of um, the things that you are, the cosmetic does uh, comes with a lot of inherent risks. Um, so I will get to that question in a second about what are some of the key challenges that cosmetic nurses face. Yeah, um, one of those being uh, the the consequences of incorrect practice. Um, but with that question on the screen. Um, what are some of the main sort of procedures or clients or roles of a cosmetic nurse? So, I mean, Bravura does, I mean, there's there's lots of things, but there's laser therapy, um, then there's injectables. Uh, yeah. Yep. So th there's a big gamut to all of it. So can you sort of explain all the different things that a cosmetic nurse could do? Um, yep. And then what are some of the challenges? All right. So... I think the biggest challenge about cosmetic nursing is that whilst it's popular, it's invisible in the literature. So I really want to start with that. I want to encourage anybody out there who's already in uh, this field or is uh, starting to be a nurse practitioner in this field, 
I want you to publish, research, research and publish because it's completely invisible what we do. So as far as scope of practice goes, it's very much um, a health model. Um, we're dealing with healthy people, age groups uh, probably from 18 to about 55 on average. And it's it's to do with skin health and um, beauty enhancement. So you asked me whether it was beauty therapy. There's a little bit of a grey area between beauty therapy and what we do as cosmetic nurses. Mm. Um, and a lot of cosmetic nurses are beauty therapists um, and have moved across, and that's absolutely fine. So the things that we would commonly do as cosmetic nurses are uh, laser and IPL. So when we use lasers and IPL, we use them for things like managing scars, reducing pigmentation, um, managing and controlling rosacea, uh, reducing capillaries um, and, and reducing the P. acnes bacteria, for example. So we use light therapies for that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that we would do is um, um, do chem uh, medical grade chemical peels, so things like Jessner's and trichloroacetic acid peels to improve skin texture, reduce pigment, reduce pores. So some of it is therapeutic, some of it's cosmetic. Um, we would also do things like um, um, skin tightening, uh, fat reduction, um, skin needling would be the other thing, resurfacing the skin using skin needling devices. And then moving into the cosmetic injectables. So the cosmetic injectables would be things like plate, using platelet-rich plasma to um, improve people's skin integrity, um, managing, um, um, sorry, um, volume loss by using dermal fillers, reducing uh, wrinkles by using uh, muscle relaxants. Okay, um, we well. do a lot of work with um, uh, um, abnormal skin conditions like melasma, uh, rosacea and acne as well, for example. So okay, quite wow. broad, yeah. It's so much more than having a needle in your hand and sticking it in someone to make their lips bigger. So much more than that. Which is which is um, probably uh, a consequence of poor media and um, a lack of education. Um, I was listening yeah. to a podcast you did recently, which was um, on the benefits. I think it was of laser and uh, women's health, um, the vaginal health oh, um, okay. post post or prenatal can you explain that sure sure so um two days a week i work in private practice with an obstetrician and gynecologist and we specialize in everything from conception through to to menopause and everything in between um so one of the things we offer is a, a vaginal laser called the diva from cyton and so what it essentially does is it's it's for a number of conditions of which postnatal is one but what it essentially does is it uses laser light to put millions of pri or thousands actually thousands of pinpricks into the vaginal mucosa and then into the lemon propria and it regenerates the tissue within the vaginal canal so it's really useful for things like um, for women who have uh, marina, for example, who are experiencing uh, vaginal dryness from the progesterone. It can be really helpful for women. Is, with is is that from a what marina? Is that is that from a lack of estrogen or what's the cause of that? Uh, marina is an intrauterine device, so it increases your progesterone. Oh. So one of the side effects yeah. can be vaginal dryness. Yeah. Um, it's excellent for um, um, for uh, mild to moderate incontinence and for the dryness and lubrication associated with menopause as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's also um, proving to be quite useful for um, bacterial vaginosis and thrush as well. Whilst it wasn't initially um, developed for that, what we're finding is that because it regenerates that mucosa and you get a lot more um, lactobacilli and a more of an acidic vagina because of that, that it's reducing vaginal infection for women as well. So it's quite a remarkable piece of equipment. Another thing you mentioned, which was interesting, and you sort of drew on, I don't know, um, the breadth of your experiences was there's two other things, not necessarily current indications, but one was about its relationship with herpes. Um, and the second one was how it could, uh, in the future, maybe um, reduce uh, women going to aged care. Can you explain how that? Oh, those two thing? things. Yeah. So first of all, um, the 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 issue I have around herpes and other sexually transmitted infections and vaginal laser. And again, anyone who's ever heard me speak about this, this will be um, really familiar to them as well. Is that 
there's a lot of um, beauty therapists and unqualified um, technicians around Australia and indeed the world performing vaginal laser for women. And it's primarily promoted as vaginal tightening. For us, what we do in our clinical practice, vaginal tightening is a bonus. It's not the reason that we actually do the procedure, but there's a lot of um, cosmetic clinics that do vaginal tightening as a, as a cosmetic procedure. Okay. My concern around that is that um, if we've got people who aren't doctors or nurses doing those procedures, <clears throat> we've got somebody who's got um, a, a latent herpes or an active herpes or some other sexually transmitted infection, it's not going to be recognised. And if you've got a patient who um, has been sexually assaulted and that hasn't been addressed prior to that procedure, mm. um, I think it's um, extremely unsettling and dangerous for the patient and inappropriate for the clinician as well. So um, I would like to see um, those devices taken out of the hands of non-medical professionals. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll continue with the, we'll go into more depth about the key challenges, including, I guess, some of the regulation. I just want to quickly digress. So as a sexual health nurse practitioner, and now we're yep. talking about vaginas and so on, there's this yep. common, you know, community stigma about these words and sexual health and STIs and so on. So what's your experience with stigma? <laughs> I see you. I, I see. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's a big topic. And I guess how do we... Uh, how do we as nurses improve this or challenge this? I want you never to be afraid to ask the hard questions. So one of the things I do in my um, women's health practice is I've got a pro forma that I use for every single new patient. So every patient I see, I ask them about sexual assault, domestic violence and sexually transmitted infections and I never assume what their sexuality is. So when I ask... Um, do, are you do, are you currently sexually active? They say yes. I say is your is your partner male, female, or both? I always ask those questions as routine. And I had a woman who um, I saw, and she was in, in seventy four. She came with her husband, and mm. um, I asked those questions. And when she came back to me the second time, she said to me. I've never been asked that before. She said, and I'm 74. She said, thank you so much for asking. And it was an opportunity to open up a whole conversation around what was happening for her and to her. And um, so I would say to the nurses, there is a lot of stigma, but you know what? It's not your place to um, put that under a rock and ignore it. It's your place as a professional to face it head on. And if you, if you, Weave it into your practice as part of routine, it gets easier and easier. Yep. So I would say weave it into your usual practice. Do you find um, back when you were a sexual health nurse practitioner that there was cohorts of um, society, male, female or, or other groups, that uh, really did struggle with um, just being human and the human, you know, consequences of unsafe sex and so on and really were resistant to change or um, I'm not exactly sure what I'm asking, but I guess there's a lot of people who would be very hesitant to to get a sexual health checkup. Yeah, of course, it's such a hard thing to disclose, isn't it? And um, I, I think nurses play a huge role in, in just being that, that acceptable space you know so many times when uh, patients come into my room you know they'll sit down and I'll ask them something and they'll just burst out crying because it's the first time that anybody's actually sat with them and asked them about what's important to them and what and what what this is like for them mm. um uh, there's always going to be people who are judgmental and I tell you what Jackson there's moments when I'm incredibly judgmental but I just sit back on that and I just I don't let it show. I've been exposed to some of the most amazingly horrendous, frightening, gobsmacking um, experiences. I had, a, I had a young man in the sexual health centre once. Um, I called him from the waiting room and he trotted up the hallway with a little red uh, Myers bag, a little plastic bag like what you would have got at the, at the cosmetic counter. Hmm. And um, as it evolved in our consultation, he was he had brought a sample of his poo in to show me 
because there was blood in his poo. And I'm like, okay. Wow. He said, do you want to have a look at it? And I'm thinking, no, I really don't want to. But, you know, you've gone to all the bottle. And he said, I've got <laughs> photos as well of the blood in my poo. And I'm like, oh, okay then. So I'm thinking I don't, I should get danger money for this job. So anyway, sure enough, there was, there was blood in his, in his species. And as it transpired, he, he was being fisted really vigorously by his partner um, through into the anus and there was a significant amount of trauma. Now, I don't know how many people could have dealt with that sort of um, presentation, but I'll never forget the second time he saw me and he came up the hallway, go, hallway he goes, oh, yeah, I'm I'm Luke, you remember me? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm never going to forget you. I know exactly who you are. Um, but um, the amount of trust it takes to for someone to bring their bag of poo to you, like, that's just uh, amazing. Like, how accepting do you have to be for somebody to do that? And I could regale you for 100 years about some of the stories that I've got. Some of the most rewarding work I've ever done is in a, a youth health service here in central Canberra. And mm. we saw young young ones that, you know, were hot, you know, homeless and drug using and sex workers. And at one stage there we had one of our young people um, to this day who's still a missing person. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, I've been exposed to a lot over time. And it's quite in contrast to enhancing someone's lips, isn't it, Jackson? <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I think we go from poo to youth justice to let's make your lips look better. Yeah. Um, I think, and yeah. I think that's one of the great things about nursing that you are a great example of is that there is so much uh, variety in a, in being a registered nurse or an enrolled nurse. Yep. Whenever I have patients who are nursing students, I say to them, "This will be the most amazing career you'll ever have. There's nothing that you can't do as a nurse." And the grounding that you that it gives you to, that translate into other parts of your life is incredible. Yeah. Mm. Um, so let's quickly go back to the cosmetic sort of challenges and regulations and things. So a lot of because there's a few questions coming through. So I might pop those up in a second. But quite a few people did ask me about what are the things they need to be wary of, and I guess the consequences and, and regulations and challenges. Um, so the things to be wary of with cosmetic nursing is the fact that if you um, don't have really great clinicals, if you're out on your own, you don't have some really good clinical systems in place, you're really vulnerable. Um, so some of the things that happen in the cosmetic arena that I'm aware of is there's um, on selling of Schedule 4 products um, goes on. There's um, the importation of a legal product, um, which is a concern. Um, there is um, relationships between doctors and nurses in writing scripts for the patients that aren't being done in a rigorous and compliant way. That would be another thing that I would say is quite risky. Um, nurses who aren't complying with the Schedule 4 uh, uh, regulations with their scope of practice, etc., are liable to lose their registration. Um, I don't know about you, but... Um, of all the assets that I have, my registration is the most precious thing I own. Um, so we need to be incredibly careful. Um, also from state to state for things like um, the use of class four lasers, um, the registration regulation and licensing varies from state to state. So um, for example, up in Queensland and over in uh, Western Australia, you need to do um, supervised practice hours to be able to operate autonomously with a laser. Whereas in somewhere like New South Wales or the ACT, you could literally buy one off eBay, set it up wow. in your garage, off you go. So there's huge discrepancies there. Mm. Um, one of the other issues within the cosmetic um, nursing industry is different types of um, machinery. So there's thousands and thousands of different devices out there and they're not all registered with the TGA. And the moment you make a therapeutic claim as a health professional or otherwise, you actually um, have to be using a device that is TGA approved for that therapeutic claim. So, for example, if you um, are promoting that you use XYZ device to um, reduce scarring or um, reduce acne, both of those are therapeutic claims. If you're using a machine that's not TGA listed for that therapeutic claim, you're actually in breach. 
So there's some real dynamite out there that you might not be aware of. Okay. Now, sort of a little bit different, but you are also with um, uh, the lead author for the scope of practice for nurse practi- uh, for um, cosmetic nursing. Yeah. Uh, so can you sort of talk about the scope of practice and sort of things that sort of came out of that? Um, Absolutely. So the, the genesis of that document was I was um, assisting the College of Cosmetic Surgery with their graduate certificate in cosmetic nursing and they were giving it, um, doing an audit on it and it became very obvious that there was nothing to audit it against. And mm. so that it's now five years old. So if there's anybody out there who's looking for a project and wants to do some research updating it, I'd be really interested to speak with you. Um, so w- what it, what that really came out of was um, I recognised that there was no benchmark to audit um, education against for a start. But the other thing that was really obvious to me was that um, cosmetic nursing in Australia, there was absolutely nothing in the peer-reviewed literature about it. And so one of the things that we took from that scope of practice document was that um, a medical colleague of an, and I published it in the Journal of Aesthetic Nursing that comes out of Britain so that we actually had something to show what we did because it would be so simple for um, bureaucrats or professional associations to say to us, um, show us the evidence about what you do. Like, what is it that cosmetic nurses do? And um, I've just finished writing a chapter for an undergraduate nursing textbook on um, cosmetic nursing. And I've done that with um, a colleague of mine, Robin Curran, who is starting to be a nurse practitioner at the moment. And um, one of the the things that we recognise um, in writing that is that cosmetic nursing isn't a specialty yet. Cosmetic nursing isn't a specialty for a number of reasons. One is that scope of practice hasn't been, um, it's been um, documented and published, but it's never been validated and it's never been rigorously researched in any way, shape or form. There's no um, specific uh, professional body that's just for cosmetic nurses. There's an interest group at the College of Nursing, but there's no association for cosmetic nurses that is um, incorporated and is actively working in this space. There's um, no rigorous documentation of the education either, Jackson. So when you say to me, what do you need to be a cosmetic nurse practitioner, uh, cosmetic nurse, I can tell you what I've done. I can tell you what's out there, but nobody has actually described what that looks like. So nobody's actually said what that postgraduate pathway might look like, what should be included in that. Um, so I think there's huge amount of work around this to be done for cosmetic nursing and do you is there how in the near future how long do you think there is a postgraduate certificate or diploma or masters in cosmetics for nurses um look there's certainly a postgraduate certificate now through the college of nursing so there's one in dermatology and one in cosmetic nursing and so there's that's only just been running from this year so that is that is a great pathway to be looking at And my understanding is that that will articulate into a master's program at some stage. I'm not sure of the detail of that at the moment, but that's my understanding of how that would work. But what I would say to the nurses that are listening to this is that have a little bit of a think about whether you want to go broad before you go narrow again. And I said that right at the beginning of our discussion tonight is do you really want to just concentrate on something as narrow as as cosmetic nursing or do you want to broaden out into primary health care and then bring it back into cosmetic nursing? Because I, the, the pandemic was a wonderful example of this. I was going to try to get through the whole thing without talking about the pandemic, you know, too. But one of the interesting things about the pandemic for cosmetic nursing is all the clinics closed down. So all of a sudden, these nurses were scrabbling around trying to find, trying to make a living. And so, so many have gone back into the hospitals and quite possibly might not come back. Look right. at Melbourne. Cosmetic clinics are all closed down there. Mm. Um So the other thing that I've always sort of banged on about is that the moment there's a cream that you rub on to reduce wrinkles that's equivalent to the injectable muscle relaxants, what's your job? So there's a a whole lot of nurses out there who've based their their career on injecting Schedule 4 medicines into people's faces, and I think that's a real trap. Um, It would only take one change in legislation and that would interrupt what 
what looked like a fairly solid career path. So my advice would be go broad, go as broad as you can, get as much experience as you can in that primary healthcare sector, um, in that community nursing sector, um, before you narrow down into anything, um, anything like cosmetic nursing. And you need that, you need that experience to be able to do your job. It's not just about making people beautiful cosmetic nursing. You have to absolutely understand um, so many other aspects. You need to understand, you know, body dysmorphic disorder. You need to understand um, rosacea. You need to understand acne, how the skin works, the, um, you know, wound, wound response and inflammatory processes. You, you need to have a really solid clinical background to be able to do it and do it well. Okay, I think that's that's some very, very wise advice that some people who are listening could take some stuff from. Now, I met a dermat... Well, I don't know. She said she was a dermatology uh, candidate nurse practitioner. Now, is this a different pathway? What's the difference between a cosmetic nurse and a dermatology nurse? Yep. So remember I said before that cosmetic nursing is the love child between dermatology and plastic surgery. It's really where those scopes of practice for both those specialties intersect. And it seems that that, that specific um, subset of skills is mm. cleaning off as its own specialty, but it's, mm. it's in transition. So dermatology nurses do a lot of similar work to what um, cosmetic nurses do. In fact, dermatology nursing is the genesis of all of all of these tasks that I, you know, all of these skills that I talked about. You know, the laser, the injecting, the managing rosacea. Mm. Um, I think they're all really similar. I don't think there's as, there's more similarities than there are differences. Okay. In fact, dermatology and the plastic surgery nurses would probably tell you that cosmetic nursing is a subset of what they do. That it's there's nothing unique about it at all. It's just a, a set of skills that they're all using. <clears throat> okay, there you go. I didn't actually know that at, that at all. Um, and that's another thing. I mean, who knew there was such a thing as a as a dermatology nurse practitioner? So there's all these things I'm learning. And I hope you guys are learning as well. Now I'm going to quickly just go to some of the questions. So guys, if you are still watching, there's quite a few of you. Just keep posting your questions about sexual health, nurse practitioner, being a business owner, or cosmetic nursing. The first thing, well, there's some f nice comments. Chris says, you look amazing. <laughs> oh, hello, Christine. I know who you are. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know Kate as well, but Kate asks, how many years of experience as a registered nurse did you have before you went down the path oh, of being a nurse practitioner? Great question, Kate. Um, let me see. I'm going to give my oh, – I'm 53 anyway. I'm not giving anything away. Um, uh, let me see. I – I finished, became a registered nurse in 1985 and then it was 1990, oh, isn't that funny? I think 1998-99. So I'd, be, I'd been around for quite some time mm. and you, you do, you need some really solid experience before you go down that pathway. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So it's probably 10, 10 or 15 years, I think. I've never the before. Yeah. There you go. And we're all learning new things. <laughs> and when, what other qualifications did you have as a registered nurse prior to that transition? Well, you did mention you were a clinical nurse consultant, so... I, I was. So, pro, to, so prior to going down the journey of being a nurse practitioner, I have a graduate certificate in HIV, hepatitis C and associated sexually transmitted infections, which I did through the New South Wales um, College of Nursing, which is now amalgamated with the ACN. So I had a graduate certificate. And then I um, went from my graduate certificate into a Masters of Nurse Practitioner program. So that was my that was my bridge. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, Ellie has said, hey, love hearing your story. So you're welcome, Ellie. Hey, Ellie, um, for listening. Thanks for being here on a Friday night with me, hey? Yeah. <laughs> um, adding to Kate's question, you're going to... Okay, so we've got Michael, Michelle, sorry. Um, adding to Kate's question, can you recommend any additional qualifications to prepare for a nurse practitioner application and in brackets, currently in primary care slash cosmetics? Yeah, keep it broad. I've said that probably about 10 times. Keep it broad, keep it broad. So I'm really glad to see primary health care is there. Um, I, I would recommend um, you stick, if you're going into cosmetics, that you stick in that primary health care field. 
and then you can just um, uh, finesse what you're doing within that to suit what your interests are, but keep it broad. Um, so certainly I'd, I would be looking at a graduate. If, if you're going into cosmetic nursing or planning to do something in the community, certainly be doing primary health care so that you're getting a broad brush of experience so you can narrow down and don't, don't paint yourself into a corner. Make sure you're highly employable if you lose interest. Um, cosmetic nursing seems really glamorous. I had um, a registered nurse who said she couldn't wait to be a cosmetic nurse so she could wear her... Um, Oh God, what are they called? What what are those white shoes that have got the Italian red, white, and blue brand? Uh, red, white, and green brand. Gucci. She couldn't wait to be a, a, a cosmetic nurse because she wanted to wear her Gucci loafers <laughs> to work. And I like. Oh I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a great motivation! And I thought that was adorable. Um, but particularly the the clients who the patients who are having just. Um, injectables for augmentation and beautification they can be really hard work and it's not as glamorous as you think when you get there so I guess the other thing besides postgraduate um, qualifications would be see if you can shadow somebody or spend some time with somebody and see if it's what you really do like personally I absolutely love working with acne scarring and skin conditions I'll walk a million miles around doing lip augmentation because it's you, not what my passion is. Do you find with Roaccutane, which is a common drug, I mean, I took that myself, do you find it's less or more uh, effective? It's really effective when you need it. I'm a strong advocate for Roaccutane and the dosage is, is much lower than it used to be in the past. Mm. Um, the moment there's any type of textural scarring with acne, I refer straight on to a dermatologist because okay. acne scarring is devastating and I know that I've lived through it. Yep. Okay, I'll come be your next client and I've got some of that on my shoulders. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. Um, now, Simon is a emergency nurse practitioner and actually one of my former Q and A guests. Now he, he asks, "Does Alyssa? I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing your wrong, name wrong. Uh, provide <laughs> business uh, <laughs> provide business education for nurses who aren't going into the cosmetic industry." Oh, Simon, I wish I could, but I'm so busy, I just can't possibly. But I tell you what, I've done. Um, I um, linked into a, a really awesome group that runs out of Sydney called. Um, uh, the Entourage. I don't know if you've heard of Jack Delosa, but he was in the um, the uh, youngest millionaires, uh, top millionaires, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, a couple of years ago uh, when I first started with, uh, with Bravura, I joined the Entourage to get some business coaching. So it's essentially um, developing up the skills that you would uh, have um, to get an MBA, but you actually work on your own business for the whole time. And I've just gone back to the entourage for the second time because I've just launched my own skincare brand called Science Skincare. And so I've gone back because I realised there's so much that I didn't learn the first time and so much that I got a little bit of taste of the first time that I had to go back. Mm -hmm. So I've invested heavily in, um, in, in doing my own business coaching and and have gone through the entourage and I've been absolutely delighted with what they provide and the support and the people that they can link you in with. So if you are interested in going into business, I would strongly recommend doing something similar to that. He's got two two or three really good books on Audible as well. I do I listen to lots of audio books because I like I, I like to call my car my mobile university. So I do lots of listening to audio books. And Jack got a book called um, Unwritten and Un Something or Rather. Those are both really awesome audio books to listen to. So yeah, invest in in exposing yourself to other businesses as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome advice for anyone wanting to start a business. Uh, Kylie, uh, Kylie, who's been a frequent listener to my Q&A, so thanks for asking another question. Uh, the stories I heard from working in detox were pretty bad. Uh, I can only imagine the stories you've got in detox. And um, I always love hearing from people who are working with their stigmatised and marginalised groups. You're a really special group of people. Um, yeah, there's a place in heaven especially for you guys. Yep, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else we've got. Oh, Kate says thank you for answering my question. It's been great listening to you. You're welcome, Kate. Um, Kathy, I'm not entirely sure what your question is, but she says, could this be applied within general practice as a practice nurse? I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. 
but um, I guess the lessons that um, she's trying to say is that keep your career broad and um, try to, if you want to be a cosmetic nurse and also get some interest experience with um, primary healthcare. Um, and, and if you're in general practice, you seriously think about doing some postgraduate studies and have a little think about if there's anything entrepreneurial within your organisation that you might like to do. I think there's lots of scope for practice nurses. Um, and one of the things that I I find nurses have a real um, problem getting their head around, because most of us come from a public health system, is that patients aren't afraid to pay for good care. And so if you've got um, a really great idea for patient care that's not, you know, funded by the public or is not Medicare rebatable, you might be actually surprised at how keen patients are to pay you for really good care. I think this is lost on nurses and I think we've missed a whole heap of opportunities. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of entrepreneurial nursing. I, no. uh, there's um, only a few in Australia. I've been chatting with a few of them. Um, it's, it's definitely a lacking area. Um, another question. Okay, so we'll skip those questions. Thanks, everybody, who's posting your questions. Keep posting them if you've got any more because um, we'll wrap this up very shortly. <laughs> We're gonna, it's 7 p.m. and I've got to go to night shift and get some dinner. Um, and I'm sure... My besties, so, yep. What's that? What's that? I've got a dinner date with one of my besties. Yep. Okay, okay. We'll wrap this up. We've got to get you to your bestie. Um, what... Uh, sorry, not what. Who has been the most inspirational nurse mentor for you and why? Oh, wow. So my most inspirational nurse mentor, and she's the first one that ever got me, um, is Professor Glenn Gardner, who's actually Emeritus pro uh, Professor now. She's retired from QUT. I'll never forget one of the first things that she said to me because she was um, working with uh, Professor Anne Gardner running the Nurse Practitioner Research Trial in Canberra, and Glenn said to me, we were actually talking about getting consent from the sex workers. And she said, do you think they'll consent to participate in research? I said, absolutely. I said, my feeling is that they love nurses. And she looked at me and she said, Alyssa, I think you're going to be the jewel in our crown. And just that one sentence kept me so motivated throughout that process. It was that research process, um, that research uh, was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It was so incredibly challenging. But she was somebody who totally got me. And interestingly enough, when I found out recently that I was going to be a grandma, she was one of the first people I told that I was going to be a granny. Um, so we've kept our relationship going for a really long time. Um, mm. she's, she's, a, she's a senior nurse that could see my potential, not just what, what I presented. And she was someone who wasn't afraid to listen to really crazy ideas and consider them. Um, and she always believed in me. One of the things she had me do, though, I must say, is when I was writing my thesis, I'd written 11,000 words for it. And she read it and she said, Alyssa, this is just just cheap. You need to delete it and start again. And I just went, what? And you know what? I deleted it and I started again. And I think I ended up with two or three publications from it and a thesis that I was really proud of. But mm. I think the strength in that was not only did she believe in me, but she also wasn't afraid to tell me when it was shit and I had to start again. And mm. I think for a mentor, that is a strength that we don't often um, um, acknowledge as being important because it's really easy to just ease someone all along on their path, but we actually need to hold the mirror up to them and say, hey, this isn't okay. I want you to be a better nurse. Uh, let's let, let's do it differently. Yeah. So, so it would be Professor Glenn Gardner has been my greatest inspiration. Yeah. That's a big shout out. <clears throat> um, <laughs> sounds like a very supportive person. Um, well, you got some... Uh, Naomi says, you were the best nurse in Canberra. Oh, how did Naomi find this group? God bless you. She's been watching me on Bravura and she knows. Oh, Naomi, thank you. Naomi and I have a very special relationship, actually. So, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're re reaching many people around Australia. Um, yeah. And I'll finish off with, um, well, someone's just asked how do they connect with you, but I'll get to that. What is next for you in your career? 
All right. So, well, Mike, it's been really interesting because I thought 2020 was going to be the worst year in the world, worst year in the world, worst year ever, but it's been it's been really great to reconsider what's what's important. So I realised that in about six years I'm going to have a little grandbaby that's going to be at school and I might want to go and be doing, you know, canteen duty and reading at kindergarten and things like that. So that's really changed my perspective. So when, when I had thought that I might not retire, I've actually started to think I've probably got other things that I want to do now. Mm. Um, so what's next? So I um, am planning on stepping out of bravura at some stage in the next few years what that looks like i'm not really sure um i have some awesome people in place and so i'll probably step back and give someone else um a bit more of a, a strong role within that to to keep driving that that um education business um and and and, and then let someone else you know do that the other thing that i've done is I, as i said i had my first pimple at 11 and i still had one just i'm getting over at 53. i've always been on on the quest to find the most amazing skincare products in the world and i couldn't find them so i developed them and so i have um just in the last few months released my own my own range called science skincare that's science skincare.com.au and um, it's highly active skincare and it includes a significant amount of um, mm. Australian botanicals in it. And so that that's the reason I went back to the entourage for the second time is that I needed to learn some, some different things. You know, I've been selling services up until now and now I'm selling products. Um, yeah, so it's quite different. And so what I'm wanting to do over the next couple of years is to is to build that business as well because I believe I've got the best skincare in the world and so I need to get it out there, get it into the hands of other nurses for their clinics and get it into the hands of the general public so that they can... Um, my aim is for no one ever having to wear makeup again because I just love their skin. That's awesome. So that, that would be ideal. So that I, I guess that's what's next. The other thing that I really want to put a shout out about is, um, as I said, I work in private practice with an obstetrician and gynecologist two days a week. Absolutely adore my job there. Work with an amazing obstetrician and gynecologist, but I need a replacement. So I need a, um, a nurse practitioner to come and replace me so I can move on from there as well. So I'm busily looking for somebody to take my place there. So if you're already a sexual and reproductive health nurse or a women's health nurse or you're aspiring to be a nurse practitioner, I'd love to hear from you because I, I need to retire at some stage and someone else needs to take over my beautiful patients and my diva laser and the great job that I have there. So I'll be looking for a replacement there. So. I liked, I'd like to say, Jackson, that I'm going to start to wind down, but I honestly Doesn't don't. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> I think I can. So I'm, I'm likely to say yes to the next thing that comes along and that will keep me hopping along for a number of years yet. Um, so I don't really know, but I do know that I, I, I will take a risk again and throw the paver down, not really knowing what I'm doing. But I don't know what the next thing is. But it'll come along. Exciting. Mm. Who knows? Lucky dip. That's the benefit of nursing, hey? Watch this space. Watch yeah. this space. Um, <laughs> how, how can our audience and anyone who watches this um, on podcasts in the future um, uh, connect with you and contact you? Oh, easy. Okay. Um, you can email me. I'll give you my email address. It's e l i s s a dot. O K double E F E at Bravura. That's B R A V U R A dot E D U dot A U. Happy to talk to you. Awesome. Um, yep. Well, do you have any final words or comments? I've got no questions for you anymore. No, look, thank you so much. Isn't it easy to fill up an hour? Jackson, thank you so much. I really love this initiative. I'm really excited to see where it goes in the future. 
it's got great legs already. Like I first came across it when you interviewed the nurse from New York who was right in the thick of the COVID-19 um, admissions and was spellbound by that. So I'm actually quite humbled to be um, just to be speaking with you tonight. Um, we've got a cornucopia of amazing nurses in Australia and I'm really excited to see who you interview next. Um, yeah, because there's there's a lot of talent out there. So good luck digging up that talent. Thank you Thanks. from the whole of the community for this initiative. I think you're doing fantastic things and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I'll um, keep okay. digging and finding further victims to come All join right. me. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Have a great night. And everyone in the audience, have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much. Have a You're really welcome. good night. Bye. See ya. Um, Thank you guys for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I learnt a lot. Um, I don't even know where to start, what I learnt. Now, you can watch these um, live in the future because I got hit. there's more and more that will keep coming out, one or every two months or so because I've also worked full time. But all our previous ones we've done, and this was our seventh, I think, and um, we've had palliative care nurse, um, so yeah, we've had palliative care, clinical nurse consultants, emergency nurse practitioners. I've had one of Australia's most senior Aboriginal nurses. I've had um, an army nurse who's in the ED and ICU. I've had um, a nurse in New York who's working in ICU. So if, if you enjoy these and you want to watch them or listen to them in your car um, and make your car your university, as our guest just said, then um, on all your podcast streamers, so your Spotify, your Apple Podcasts, stream, whatever it is, uh, you'll find it. Just type in the nurse break and you'll be able to listen to them as podcasts. Um, you can also find these videos on Facebook so you can actually watch them if you want. If you just go to the nurse break Facebook page and then go to the video section. Um, so that's that. We've also got heaps and heaps of really cool articles um, coming, some cool stuff coming. We've got, uh, I've got stomal nurse consultants. I've got a mental health, mental health, a mental health, um, liaison nurse. I've got the CEO of the Royal Flying Doctors Service in Queensland, who's also a nurse. Um, I've got grads. Um, I'm going to get CEOs. I'm going to get senior nurses. I'm going to get chief nurses um, from all around Australia. I've got um, senior heads of nursing at several different universities who are also um, collaborating with me. So um, if you're interested in getting inspired, then you can read their articles on the website, which is www.thenursebreak.com. Uh, dot org. Um, otherwise, just tag along on Facebook. Um, I'm going to go have dinner and go to night shifts. So thank you for tuning in, guys, and have a really good night. And goodbye. <laughs>